thank you. Uh, well, good work. Uh, so just a little bit more about me. Uh, I am actually lead author of that book, uh, The Art of SEO, uh, used by a lot of people as a textbook. Uh, I do write columns in a whole bunch of places, Forbes, Copy Blogger, places like that. Um, also, I run two, oh, oops, wait, I'm missing it. I do run two live video broadcasts um, every week, one called the Digital Marketing Answer Show, the other called the Digital Marketing Excellence Show. Those are on uh, the Google Plus Hangouts on air. Uh, so those are cool if you're interested. We have great guests all, all the time. Uh, Rand actually will be on with us on July 10th. Um, we have Danny Sullivan before, Lee Oden has been on just recently. So a lot of good speakers. Uh, probably the most interesting fact about me is this. Uh, 1984, I was world champion in Golden War. I know that seriously dates me. <laughs> okay. and I'm willing to accept that. But on the other hand, if you need to win a bar bet, I'm your guy, okay? So just let me know and maybe go, you go know, get some free beers or something along those lines. So um, anyway, uh, I'm here to talk about hummingbirds, which interestingly enough happened to be the animal we chose for the color of our O'Reilly book. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's pure coincidence, by the way, although we would never admit that in public. Uh, but uh, um, O'Reilly in their Art of series allows you to pick uh, animals. Um, we just happened to pick a hummingbird back in 2009. So uh, it really looked like we knew what was going to be coming along the way here. So um, first thing I want to start you with is uh, a little bit about what Google's product is really structured like, because the way we tend to talk about it is, is a little bit misinformed. Um, there's a crawler, uh, there's an index, and then finally you have the search engine. And we tend as a, a community to refer to the set of all three things as the search engine. But from a practical, technical perspective, um, the uh, search engine is the component over here that actually figures out how to take a user query and fish stuff out of the index, right? Uh, and then when you add in the knowledge graph, um, which is these structured databases that answer questions like uh, how many calories in an apple, if you type that in uh, Google, uh, there's really a fourth component. And this actually proves to be important in understanding what Hummingbird really is. All right, because Hummingbird isn't all four of those things, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But first, I want to give you a little more background about why Hummingbird was important uh, to Google. All right, and the first of those reasons is the explosion of different types of devices, uh, you know, mobile phone devices, things like this, uh, that uh, um, uh, have, have really hit us, right? It's now like, okay, if we have these size smartphones, we have slightly larger smartphones, we have somewhat larger again smartphones, we have iPads, mini iPads, uh, other kinds of devices. Uh, it's, it's just an innumerable amount of different kinds of devices, driven by the fact that we all like to have it exactly the way we prefer. Oh, that screen size, a half inch smaller, is so much better for me because I can fit it in my briefcase. Or, I like the larger screen because I want more room for my fingers on the keypad, or whatever the reason may be. Um, and uh, it was really interesting. I was at SMX Advanced just a few weeks ago, or a couple weeks ago, uh, and Matt Cutts actually said that on Google, search queries from mobile devices will exceed search queries from desktop devices before the end of this year which is something that really stuns a lot of people, right? Because it just shows us how rapidly this transition is going. He also said something to the effect when he was asked uh, uh, to give one last tip at the end of his uh, session where Danny Sullivan was interviewing him. What was the one thing that he would leave people with? And the one thing was, mobile is coming faster than you think, right? Uh, how many people feel like they're mobile ready here in this room? Come on. Not a lot. How many feel like they're not mobile ready? Then we'll see how many people aren't going to answer. So most of you, right, uh, uh, that feel like you're not mobile ready. Uh, and that's really a huge deal in, in this picture because it's coming like a tidal wave, right? Um, so 
In fact, here's you know some data. It's actually a little bit old. Sorry about that. But uh, uh, you know, just the, the growth curve of the uh, the mobile devices is just meteoric. And the same for smartphone uh, type sales, just really going just completely through the roof. Uh, you know, everybody has more than one device these days, it seems. And as you get more and more into mobile devices, people are going to start using voice more to conduct their searches. And they're going to start using natural language. And this is really a big driver uh, behind why Hummingbird is so important. I'll get into that in, the, in a bit. Uh, Google's investing like crazy in this. Uh, this is just a, a white paper that they have online, a case study on voice search, which if you're really into um, getting you know, into the details of this, it's worth a thorough read. Um, but um, you know, here, recently, who was happy about author rank, uh, authorship photos going like, <laughs> oh, actually we have some people working. Okay. And who was really upset? Oh, and there we go, probably more, more in that game, right? So um, John Mueller of Google, what he said about this was the reason why they did it, was there were two reasons. First was, well, we didn't really see an increase in click-through rate anyway. I'm paraphrasing. But, um, uh, OK. He didn't actually explain how they were interpreting that. But it may be that their overall click-through rate on search in aggregate didn't change. <coughs> Even though the specific things with the photos, it did change and, and go up. There's no way if you have 10 results on a page and there's one author photo in the middle, that isn't going to get more clicks. I mean, come on. Right? Um, and uh, the other thing that he said, it was driven by mobile. All right? Uh, again, back to this, more than half their search is going to be from mobile devices before the end of the year. Well, okay, think about it for a second. I have my mobile phone. One of the biggest concerns people have about uh, surfing or searching on a mobile device is how long uh, it takes to get the content. It's a big thing. That's why Google has started to talk about uh, page speed as a ranking factor. Well, if you're into the technical details about how all this stuff works, the more files that have to be downloaded, all right, when you're sending a screen, a, a, a web page through to a, a browsing device, the longer it's going to take inherently. And every author photo here is another file. Actually, it's going to materially slow down the download of a mobile device. On a desktop device, we don't care. But more than half their searches are going to be for mobile devices. So, Mobile is actually having a big enough impact on them now that they're changing and potentially even degrading the experience on a desktop device because the mobile device is more important to them. So that's a very interesting thing to try to think about in the process. So, and here's what uh, Greg Sterling said about it. I tried really hard to find some real market data that shows the explosion of voice search and how much is going on. But, um, you know, it's basically that they're expecting uh, uh, searches on the Android devices at least because they have so much support built in there to actually uh, be more voice search than typed search. I mean, think about it. This keyboard here, you know, I mean, it's not like a prime experience, especially for me if I'm not wearing my glasses uh, or if I'm my fat finger is trying to get those things. But it's really easy to speak a command into, uh, into, the, into the box. And then, of course, you've got different kinds of wearable devices. Uh, Google Glass. Um, you've got, OK, here's somebody putting uh, something in their mouth. Any, any volunteers? Uh, yeah, not me. Uh, so somebody's got something grafted under their skin. Uh, there's all different kinds of wearable devices that are, that are coming out. Of course, there's some environments where it won't work very well. Like if you're in a cube farm, then you know, you're probably not going to want to do your voice search for hemorrhoid medication. Or, <laughs> uh, you know, um, it just probably wouldn't work very well. But so let's go back to this picture um, and, that I showed you before. Caffeine, when it came out, rewrote the first two parts of the search engine, right? The crawler and the indexing side. And that was in 2010. 
And that was a huge upgrade for Google uh, to, to make this change. It was really oriented around uh, making the search engine uh, dramatically faster and able to uh, uh, index, discover and index more content. Uh, some would argue, by the way, that the Panda algorithm was uh, a, a consequence of caffeine because they had so much more content in their index that, uh, uh, that they, they discovered all kinds of crappy stuff and they were ranking it and they had to do things to, to try and deal with it. So, um, so that's uh, uh, our friend Caffeine. But up till last year, they've never rewritten from scratch the search engine part of the platform. Okay? And that's what Hummingbird is. Okay? Forget everything, everything else you've ever read about it. Hummingbird is not just natural language search. It is a very big piece of it, and it is actually going to be most of what I'm going to talk about. But it's a rewrite of the search platform, and there are other things that went into it at the same time to make it more dynamic and more flexible and able to do things. The consequences of which will probably be as large in the end as it was with caffeine. Do remember, who remembers caffeine in this room, by the way? So a lot of you do. Right. So when caffeine came out, it was like, well, nothing changed. Right. There weren't big ranking of peoples and all that. Uh, that all kind of came a little bit later. And, and this is the story with Hummingbird as well. Platform rewrite. It wasn't about changing things. The other thing to know is algorithms like Panda and Penguin and uh, you know, link-based algorithms and all that, those are just modules that plug into Hummingbird. Hummingbird isn't at the same level, though. Like, those things are small little subsets. They're, they're, they're very specific algorithms within the, within the search engine that Google didn't change when they released Hummingbird. So Hummingbird was at you know, a whole other level. So, um, but uh, oh, okay. Now we're going to try something dramatic here. We'll see how it goes. I want you to. Uh... Hummingbird is the name of Google search engine. And all those other names you hear uh, are parts that work within the Hummingbird search engine. Sorry, Okay, we'll get through this in a second. So this is from an interview I did last time. One of the things that I actually did want to spend a little time on was our friend Hummingbird. That was an algorithm they announced on their 15th birthday party. So Hummingbird is a platform and so we don't really know the upshot of that yet. We understand that Google is a search engine, and within that name is the engine part, and the search engine actually takes its name from three different things that are all involved into a search engine. There is, of course, the finder or the indexer, the thing that goes out and finds the pages and the content from across the web, brings that all back and stores it within what's called the index, which is, I often say to people, it's like a big book of the internet. When you want to find something, you sort through that index using the search engine that's in taking its name, even though there's three different parts that are involved. Because Hummingbird is the Google search engine. That's perhaps the best way to think about it. We didn't really have a name for the Google search engine. It's just the Google search engine. But over time, it has been upgraded in various ways. Some people have heard that there was this caffeine upgrade. And if you think about caffeine, what caffeine was really about was almost making the the engine itself be able to run faster. It, it, it was sort of an overhaul to let it pull in you know, more fuel or pull in more data, but it didn't necessarily change how that data was ranked. When you heard about things like Panda or Penguin, those were like taking an oil filter off that was you know, pretty good, catching some of the particulates or whatever, and putting on a new oil filter, adding an additional one that's especially meant to go after a certain kind of bad pollutant that you don't want to have in your in engine gunning up all the works. And then, you know, so you, well, we'll screw in a panda filter over here. And then when we talk about having penguin, we'll put on a new penguin air filter up here. But the engine itself didn't change. What Hummingbird did was basically Google rebuilt the entire engine. So it took off all those pieces. They didn't continue to use 
some pieces. They added on new things to process data that maybe they couldn't use before. Panda filter got screwed back in there. The Penguin filter got put up on there. PageRank is still in there. All this other stuff is going on. But you could think that perhaps what they also added was for an engine that could only use, say, gasoline to begin with, they added in some additional parts that can now maybe handle diesel. Or now they've added in a hybrid unit so that it's a little more efficient. Or now that they've put in something that can switch over to compress natural gas. And so they can take in all this different kind of fuel or all these different kinds of signals. They can also process that information in, in other ways. But by and large, the engine is still running the way the engines worked before. It, it's you're still kind of running on gas. It's still doing all the same kinds of things, which is why when they made this big change, no one really noticed it. Because they didn't just change everything radically. It wasn't like suddenly we were on a bicycle engine that they popped in there or <laughs> anything like that. Right. You know, that. That they were really just trying to rebuild this engine so that it would have new life. That the last time they put an engine, if you think about it in search engine terms, you know, you were driving along in this car and um, you know it was built in the 1950s. They've got some new technologies out there and they can come up with some better, more efficient engines. That's what Hummingbird now Hummingbird is the name of Google search engine. And all those other all right, so I just wanted to show you that because Danny Sullivan was actually at the uh, um, uh, at the event where Google revealed that uh, Hummingbird exists, and and so just uh, and he got to talk to them. They actually alluded to uh, he mentioned it very briefly there that Hummingbird could be used to process new kinds of signals, right? Uh, and that could be you know at some point the mythical authoring even though author photos went away, that doesn't necessarily uh, go away. We don't have author rank today, but it could happen. Or it could be social signals or things like that. Uh, and some, or some completely new signal we haven't thought about. Maybe user engagement signals at a whole, whole new level. So these are all things that Hummingbird enables. But because it's the most obvious thing to talk about, I am going to talk about um, uh, natural language search. I'm going to show some examples for a little bit. Uh, and then uh, uh, we'll uh, do some more demos, and then we're going to talk about how this all matters to you and how it changes what you do with your uh, SEO strategy. So, oops, well, I mean, here, obviously, you get the calories for something. Um, you can compare things, uh, Jupiter versus Saturn, you know, apples versus oranges, things like that. These are examples of things that are coming out of the knowledge graph, right? It's a structured database where they've assembled information and boom, they have all this data there uh, and, and you know, they can do whatever with it. Um, but here are some other things. This is actually kind of old. This has been true for a long time. But it is an example of the kind of thing that Hummingbird does. Somebody does a search on car repair and it will bring up something related to auto repair, right? Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, here's a carousel. Uh, I actually just asked for Italian restaurants, and it knew that I was in Marlborough, Massachusetts when I asked this question. So the carousel is for restaurants near me. That's related, right? This is, uh, and by the way, to some degree, um, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about can also be considered semantic search, right? So this is, uh, you know, related to that. And then here, you know, Red Sox versus Yankees, I did this search query here, and uh, and you can see it shows the schedule for the next few games coming up. This is actually, I did this last fall, but, but this still works today. Um, and in fact, here I did it today, uh, and I got a very different kind of thing using the, uh, uh, the schedule for tonight's game. I did this this morning. Um, and then, you know, if I do it during the off season, it gives me a page with the history of the rivalry. So it actually understood the context based on the time of year, which is really cool. The, the, they actually have it so that it knew, okay, is there a game right now? Okay, or a game today, so it gave me today's schedule. Or is a game coming, uh, a series coming next week? It gave me the whole series. Or is it uh, off season, and therefore someone's more likely to want an informational query? This is actually part of what Hummingbird was all about taking the ability to process natural language queries, understand the user's intent and the context of the query, and change what gets served in the search results. It's actually a really big deal for them. Um, and then, you know, here's an example. During a Patriots playoff game, you get a current score. 
it didn't really work out that well for us, by the way. Uh, Denver went to the Super Bowl, uh, so um, it was a hard day. But uh, it wasn't that bad at that time. So, um, so and then also we've got uh, this is new. This just started happening in the past couple of weeks. Uh, that Google is now processing certain kinds of queries and deciding to show how-to lists. So how to reset iPhone. A lot of people are upset about this, right? Because this website here, uh, pcadvisor.co.uk, is having their content uh, shown by Google in the search bar. It's right there, right? Step one, two, and three. And if all you want to do is reset your iPhone, you know, you're done. You don't actually have to go to their website. You won't see their ads. You won't do whatever it is that uh, they're hoping you would do. So um, uh, there are others, by the way, who argue that it's great brand value, right? And arguably, it is great brand value because you've been selected as the authority by Google. How well that works for you depends on how your business is structured, right? I mean, if you're a mod like Rand, Rand's company, then it could work really well for you to be shown as the authority because you're all into the premium thing. If you don't really care that much about your brand and you're uh, you know, just looking for these kinds of clicks to be the money, money making things for your website, then you know, this is no good. Here's another one. Um, uh, I actually laughed at this one about making French toast. Uh, and the reason why I laughed about it is uh, for years, uh, I've been showing slides, like, I mean, I mean, like three years now, I've been showing slides like this one, entitled, entitled How to Make French Toast, um, and you know, 33,000 results. It's really easy to make French toast, right? I haven't made or eaten French toast in probably 20 years. I can still tell you how to make it, okay? It's just not hard. You don't need 33,000 pages on the web with this in the title tag, right? You just don't. How many, I mean, think, how many search results do you think Google would really need for a query like this, right? I mean, seriously, you can have a video, you can have one that throws nutmeg or cinnamon in or something like that, but you don't need very many of these queries. So, I mean, and they took the bull by the horn and said, okay, we don't need as many of these queries, so let's do this, right? Um, so they, they just serve the answer. Um, so I'm going to walk you through an example uh, sequence of uh, just to show another aspect uh, of Hummingbird in action. So well, first of all, let's give me pictures of, of Tom Brady. Okay, New England Patriots fan, don't hate me. Um, uh, you can hate my football team, it's not my fault. Um, so uh, give me pictures of Tom Brady. Uh, how tall is he? Boom, this is a, like a knowledge graph type answer. Pulls that out of a structured database. Okay. Uh, who's his wife? Giselle Bunchen. Okay, married in 2009. Next piece of data. Does he have children? List his children. Uh, in spite of what people think, they're only three. Um, uh, and uh, when did he start playing football? This is kind of intriguing, this particular one, because all those other answers came out of the knowledge graph of the database, right? This one actually went and found one of the best results off the web, uh, a story of a boy named Tom Brady, and then it actually talks about when he started uh, playing football. So um, that's a great query. All right, now I'm going to try another demo. Let's see how, uh, a demo. Let's see how this goes. Uh, bear with me. <coughs> Where is the Empire State Building? Pictures. Who built it? Restaurants. 
<laughs> That's great. All right, there's a demo in action right there. They didn't do that in my hotel room, I promise you. Italian restaurants.
But the idea is that if you have pages that are ranking really well, and they use, uh, there's, this is for probably women's dress shoes or something like that. Um, uh, it, you know, they probably have the word shoes on there some, and boots on there, and women's, but they have other things on there, like uh, site, price, uh, uh, you know, view, uh, shipping. If it's an e-commerce page, you don't find that content on it, something's wrong, right? So Google is beginning to look at a much broader context of the content on your page to decide whether it's quality content, OK? This is semantic search in Hans Hummingberg uh, in action. So this data I'm showing you here is from a study that was done by uh, Search Metrics, uh, Marcus Tober's uh, company. He presented on this at uh, SMX Advanced in Seattle. Um, and so let me explain what they did. They took 30 different, the top 30 websites across, I think it was uh, 25,000 search queries. And they did co-occurrence analysis to see what words happened in common and whether or not, and then you know, what were the most common words. And then of those, among the top sites, was a better and more comprehensive use of those words correlated with higher ranking. In other words, if you use more of the right phrases, and I don't mean repeating the keyword over, but the supporting words that would indicate that it's a quality page because it completely addresses the user's potential intent behind a search query. Ooh, I got that whole sentence out OK. <laughs> um, and it showed a very strong correlation across these 25,000 results that the highest ranking results tended to have a much higher usage of the words that matter. This is really huge, OK? This is a, a whole nother science to get into when you're doing SEO. So here's some data actually out of the search metrics tool. Uh, I think it has a view and sale on it. Um, uh, if you go, I didn't show the whole thing because it would have gotten blurry, uh, or print would have gotten too small. But the words like price and shipping are, are, are in there, too. So this idea that Google is now doing a more sophisticated semantic analysis of your page, I've shown you on the search results side of things it matters. But now I'm showing you that it matters from a ranking perspective as well. And that's what's really, uh, really interesting about this. So OK, now what do we have to do? Well, there's a number of ways you can go about it. And I think they're all worthwhile. One is that a relatively boring and hard work sounding thing like finding out what your users' wants and needs are. Uh, and uh, you know, conducting user groups, uh, maybe uh, bringing in usertesting.com and using them to test your site, see what they like and don't like. Uh, you could potentially do it with Mechanical Turk as well, just uh, collect data. Uh, and then you get all that and you map your web design and the content to user needs, and, and that's all uh, good. And, uh, great sounding stuff, but let's just look at it a little bit. So here's an example. Uh, oh, yeah, so uh, if you have a sports site and you have a page for Tom Brady and another one for Peyton Manning, um, it's probably a really good idea on there to talk about the comparison between the two because it's a really popular search query, right? So this is just a very simple example. Um, here's another thought. What if Google has, well, Google has the data, but let's say Google's data tells them that 25% of the people who search on Eiffel Tower want to know its height. Well, then having that height on your page about the Eiffel Tower improves your chances of ranking for that search word. So it's beginning to think about your pages from a different perspective. So if you have a pizza place in Las Vegas, um, this is all really great stuff to have on it. Uh, menu hour prices, coupons, do you have a bar, do you take reservations? Local language, okay? If you're, uh, uh, they might refer or talk more about different kinds of pizzas in Vegas than they do in Minneapolis versus Boston. So, uh, you know, I, I don't have a pizza example, but uh, 
Uh, in Boston, when we talk about subs, I don't use this word, but sometimes they get called hoagies, um, and which isn't used anywhere else in the country. But if you're local to that market, then you should have the local market language on your site. So schema is a really great thing to think about, too. Um, uh, and there's a couple of reasons to do this. Uh, uh, if you have the capabilities of business, you should implement schema uh, even if Google isn't current, currently using schema to show rich snippets. Schema is no longer just about rich snippets. It's also about giving Google semantic data which it can use to, to better uh, rank uh, your page. And even if you don't have uh, programming talent, and you, and you can't do schema, you don't have enough programming talent, or no, enough time, at least make sure the information is on the page. And you want a great way to find out what search engines might care about having for your category or product line? Go to schema and see all the fields they implemented. Schema was decided upon by Bing, Yahoo, and Google. They've given you a blueprint for the information that they're interested in. So understanding what they're asking for there is a, is a really interesting thing to do. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, we got time for a few questions here, so um, who, uh, who wants to go first? Do you want to right here? Sorry. You got to go through the Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not an SEO, so forget the question. It's silly. Uh, but, so I am wondering uh, how robust is the semantics, semantic understanding of how many words? So, for example, um, if I have a site on the basketball, right? Now, obviously, if I have basketball and the definition, it will find that. But what if I just have the definition? What if I just have a spherical round object um, used in a game, you can dribble it, et cetera, et cetera? Will I still then make for basketball? So, um, you know, image recognition is one of those things that's actually very tricky uh, uh, for, for Google, not because they're not capable of it. And I'll, I'll just give you an example. You, if you have a picture of the Taj Mahal on your desktop, you can drag that picture into Google Image Search and drop it into the search box, and it will tell you that it's the Taj Mahal and show you other pictures of the Taj Mahal. They have the technology, but excuse me, at the scale of the web, they don't do it in practice. So they probably won't recognize that picture as being a basketball. It, it's very computationally intensive. It's one of the things that's hard for people to grasp when we talk about search algorithms in general. We, we have this notion that because we can conceive of potential ranking factor, we lead to, oh, Google must be using it. And unfortunately, it's, it's harder. It's always harder to think. So I would probably get the word basketball on, uh, on that page to answer your question. With Google responding, with, their, with the voice to queries. What do you think is on the horizon with paid search and organic as far as queries like best Chinese restaurant? Do you think it will respond with an answer that you know this restaurant gets the highest rank organically or uh, this ad for this Chinese restaurant is the highest on the page? Or do you think it'll continue to just return? We found 10 restaurants that qualify as Chinese restaurants. Yeah, it, it's a, another tricky scenario. Uh, personally, uh, you, could, you could imagine they might use review data, right, to do that. Uh, but uh, from Google's perspective, they really care a lot about statistical significance. So if you're in market in um, uh, the Top, top reviewed restaurant has five reviews and the next one has two, they probably won't consider that statistically significant. So that my guess is that they wouldn't do that. Uh, but might they in scenarios where it's a market where somebody has you know, 43 reviews and the next, the next one has uh, 38 and somebody else has 25, uh, and it starts to be enough data that they care about the answer. 
back to you? Would they, would they, they might, yeah. Tell you the answer? If you're doing a voice search, there's a really good chance that they'll keep it back to you, as you, uh, as you saw with, uh, with my demo. But, but I do think it's a very tricky scenario when you're talking about this. User-generated content is not something that Google loves. I mean, it, it's too easily gamed. It's, and it, it, people don't even have to be thinking about search. Right, uh, you know, they're going to go game reviews, and uh, you know, they're going to have the ten customers who came up to the major D and said, "Oh, the service is so great tonight." Oh, here, here's a review. You know, I mean, they're going to they're going to kind of game that system. So, uh, I, I, ultimately, what they do is test it and see if it improves their results. So, just one last part of my question. So if, if there was a Chinese restaurant in New York and it was the best Chinese restaurant, there was a name of it. And I spoke to my phone and I said, where's the best Chinese restaurant? Would it return that as the answer? I have no clue. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it very well might. But uh, I think the problem with that is it's a classic case of an ambiguous query. Right, uh, and it's like the, doing a query on Jaguar, for which there's an operating system, a guitar, uh, a football team, an animal, and a car. Yeah. Right, so for those kinds of queries, they would need some sort of tiebreaker, and if they don't have it, they probably wouldn't be my guess. Yeah. Eric, we, uh, when we hear about common word, we hear about semantic search, we often hear uh, recognition and the extraction. Can you talk a little bit about how entities uh, and name entities play into hummingbird and semantic search? Yeah, uh, great great question and great topic area. Um, so I, I actually should have talked about it. When I went through the Tom Brady scenario, it, that's an example of an entity, uh, Tom Brady in this case, and understanding relationships uh, so Tom Brady is a person who has a birth date, he has a height, he has, in, in his case, he has a spouse, he does have children, he has a football team. Oh, the football team is another entity, as are all the other things I said, uh, children and the wife are entities too. But the football team, uh, and they have rivals in the same division and the same conference, and they have schedule, and um, so uh, entities are really a big deal. It's a it's kind of the next step past a structured database, right? Structured database is, okay, this is all pre-qualified information, but now the idea is to use entities and, and relationships that you can discern from looking across the web to uh, uh, decide on other relationships that exist. It, it is a very big deal. Yeah. Here we go. I remember seeing a search engine watch um, I, when he was asking about the best Chinese restaurant and you were talking about user generated data. I remember seeing a study linked from search engine watch about um, the, the semantic kind of preference of best versus not using best and the weight that it places on reviews in terms of the amount of reviews. So do you think that, that's, that that is a true thing? Um, or do you personally not place a whole lot of weight in reviews? Uh, I've been seeing that a lot, a lot more often recently. Yeah, um, well, I mean, they, they obviously use it to a certain degree in local search right now, right? Um, uh, so they have enough confidence in it that they're using it there. Um, just my fear of thinking about it is it's, um, the data quality is going to be really uneven. And that's, that's just the problem. So. It all comes down to testing for them. You know, they, they have a massive process for testing every algorithm change they roll out. It starts from, uh, you know, the internally run tests, uh, and then people being brought in, human reviewers brought in to Mountain View, because they literally come into Mountain View with screens on the right days. Um, and then finally they will test, test something on a sample of uh, the actual live search database. So they might take a, a 
uh, you know, a, a quarter of a percent, which is still an ungodly number of searches, um, uh, and, uh, and see how it plays in the real world. And if all that works, then they'll run with it. Um, so I think reviews, um, obviously they like it enough to deal with it with global search, and it's probably because it's one of the better uh, ranking factors uh, or better quality factors in the local search arena, which to me suggests that the local search data is available and it's pretty weak. That's just my take on it. You've been primarily talking about Google's coming work. Uh, what about other search engines? Are they going down similar paths or are they, you know, what's happening? Yeah, uh, so Bing is definitely uh, doing stuff in this arena. Um, it's, it's interesting, it, it kind of speaks to one of the odder dynamics of our industry, which is that you know, Google is very vocal about everything they're doing. Uh, and every time Google releases uh, some new major feature, uh, it kind of quietly, in some form, shows up in, in Bing, you know, within a month or two after that. Uh, probably because you know all the Bing engineers working on that aren't allowed to go home or go to sleep until they get out the door. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, they're absolutely. I mean, actually, looking at it more broadly, for Bing, what they really have to do to succeed in gaining real market share is that they have to find some new area of technology like this and beat Google to the punch in a big way. And they haven't really done it, but they're investing as heavily as they possibly can. Yeah, I'm just curious, is there any layer of personalization that exists within these types of search results? You know, for example, me logging your Google account, um, who's in your circles, but along that, that stream of queries, does that come into play in this, in this shift in the change the algorithm at all? Um, so, uh, personalization, I think, you I think of it as a separate thing, but it obviously has a significant overlap, right? Because it is changing the search results to better meet your intent. Uh, so, and personalization efforts have been underway for a long time. And let's be clear about what personalization might be. Um, uh, so, one thing personalization isn't is where you're located. Google doesn't consider that personalization. So, even if you go into incognito mode, or log out on Google, it will still consider where you're located um, uh, in the search results. But um, personalization does interact with this very heavily, and it's all part of better mapping that intent. Uh, question. So in the knowledge graph, I think it's great for users, especially when you go that obviously is great for website owners. Um, do you think there'll ever be like antitrust implications for Google for certain um, well, the one word answer is no. But the lengthier answer is uh, that uh, uh, public domain information, they, they can do whatever they wish with. You can question how they get it. That's a different issue. But another piece of advice I give to all of you is don't build your business around making money off of serving public domain information to Google search results. Because if you do that, those pages will not do well. All right, this is uh, just one last question here, and then uh, we'll wrap it up. Here. Um, so post hummingbird, were you still searching for a local business and include a geo modifier? So take, for example, New York personal injury journey. We see a lot of directories in search results, but when you remove the geo modifier, you get the local small business results. Uh, why do you think we see this? And is this a glitch, or do you think that was intentional? Okay, so we're searching for New York personal injury attorneys. We get directories. We remove New York, and we get the local listing. And then you get the business listing. That's yeah, that's interesting. Um, Have you come across that? Well, I mean, I've seen things like it, yes, and I, I think. Uh, all I can tell you is it's got to be the result of testing that they've done. Um, and for some reason, <coughs> when people add the modifier New York, it tends to mean that they want a directory more. And when they don't have the modifier New York, it 
tends to mean, um, you know, I need one like now. Okay. And, you, and then therefore they want the closest one. One's kind of shopping and the other is needed now. That would be my guess. All right, uh, I think that'll all wrap it up. Thank you very much, Eric. All right.